people in ancient societies made a distinction between warrior knowledge and scribe knowledge. Scribe knowledge is the knowledge that comes from words, knowing definitions, what a word means, how to read texts, that sort of thing. Warrior knowledge is more practical. Simply knowing the names of your enemies doesn't win out over them. You need to know the practices. You need to know the techniques. You need to know the strategies. You need to know the right attitudes that actually work. This is something that comes with experience. And it's a kind of knowledge that also comes from adversity. There's going to be battles. There are going to be problems you have to deal with. The Dharma is basically warrior knowledge. Most of us learn it first as scribe knowledge. We learn about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Noble Path and all the many lists that the Buddha taught. But when you boil down the the basic teachings, the ones he said that were really important, he focused on the Wings to Awakening, which when you look at the different lists, are lists of qualities of the mind that are going to be needed as you take on your battle with your defilements and all the unskillful things going on in the mind. In other words, warriors do need a certain amount of scribe knowledge just so they can recognize who's an enemy, who's a friend, and learn about various techniques, various strategies. But then you've got to put it into practice, and it's in dealing with your own defilements and your own unskillful qualities. That's when you really learn, one, what the words mean, and then two, how they're best put to use. And so as we're sitting here doing battle with whatever thoughts in the mind want to pull you away from concentration, want to get in the way of your discernment, it's good to think of some basic warrior principles. First one is choose your battles. You can't take on every battle that comes your way, every issue that comes your way. You've got to decide that some things are worth fighting for and other things are not. Of course, from the Buddhist point of view, the main battle is inside. As he said, you could win out over thousands of other people, but it wouldn't be nearly as honorable as winning out over yourself. So remember, this battle in here is the important one. Be willing to lose a few battles outside if that's what's required to be victorious here, inside. The second principle is always be on your guard. This is the teaching on heedfulness. Greed, aversion, and delusion don't come up only while you're sitting and meditating. In fact, they come up all the time, and they're more likely to come up while you're not meditating, and they can do a lot of damage. So you have to be prepared to watch out for these things all the time. This is why we practice restraint of the senses. When you see something, ask yourself, who's doing the looking? And what qualities of the mind are being nurtured by the way you look? Is lust doing the looking? Is anger doing the looking? Greed? Jealousy? Resentment? If so, it's going to inflame these qualities in the mind. Your choice of what you look at and how you look at it, and this applies to all the senses. It's part of a causal chain, and it's happening all the time. And you'll find that if you're not careful as you go through the day, it's a lot harder to get the mind to settle down when you finally do, do formal meditation. And it's very easy to lose what you've gained. One of John Fuang's students was sitting and meditating one day with him in Watmakut in Bangkok. 
and the session had gone very well. And then she had gone home and talked with a friend, and that nice state of mind she had just deteriorated right away. She went to mention this to him the next day, and he said, what you did was you took gold and you traded it in for excrement. When you've got a good state of mind going at the end of the meditation, try to maintain it through the day. Protect that. And one of the best ways of protecting is to be very careful how you engage with your senses. So be on the lookout every time you look or listen. And this is something you're doing all the time, so it means all the time. Be careful about what states of mind are giving the directions and which ones are being nurtured by what you're doing, how you're doing it. So if anything comes up and you can nip it right in the bud. It's a lot easier to deal with it when you nip it in the bud rather than letting it grow. All too often our attitude is, well, it's just a little tiny thought of greed, it's not much of a problem. Or even just the thought that you'd like to think a thought of anger, you'd like to think a thought of lust. It comes and whispers and it goes away. And if you don't immediately counteract it, you've laid the seed for this thing to suddenly grow. So you've got to be on your guard all the time. As for dealing with other people, the way to protect yourself, the best way to protect yourself is to have goodwill and develop it in all directions, with all beings. On the one hand, if you're spreading thoughts of goodwill, other people will feel a good energy coming from you. And then too, you'll learn how to trust yourself more. If you really do genuinely have goodwill for other people, even difficult people, then you're less likely to act in an unskillful way around them. In other words, you can learn how to trust yourself more in your dealings with other people. And that's the main issue where you want protection is in your actions. So heedfulness and goodwill, these are your protections. Restraint of the senses, these are your protections. This is what keeps you on your guard. You know those stories about the person who wanted to study sword fighting. So he goes to his master and asks to learn sword fighting. So instead of teaching the guy how to do sword fighting, the master has him haul water, cut wood. And the guy's complaining, I don't see him learning anything about sword fighting. But then every now and then the teacher would attack him with a stick. And finally one day, the young student was ready for the teacher. The teacher attacked with a stick, and the student put up, a, I guess, the top of the pail, which he could use as his shield. And he realized that this is what the teacher had been teaching him, how to be on your guard all the time, even when you're carrying water, hauling water, chopping wood. So have that attitude as you go through the day. Your defilements can come up at any time, so you've got to be prepared for them at any time. Now this connects with a third main principle, which is you've got to think strategically. You know, being heedful all the time, being on your guard all the time, can be really wearing unless you have some source of strength, which is why you don't spend all your time analyzing your defilements and picking them up and beating them up. You've got to get the mind into a state of concentration to give yourself strength. As the Buddha said, you can know all the drawbacks of sensuality and still go for sensual pleasures if you don't have an alternative kind of pleasure. So you need this other pleasure, the pleasure of concentration, the pleasure of a centered mind to give you strength, to give you an alternative place to feed. Otherwise the mind is going to go sneak off and feed behind the wall. In other words, it's going to go for different kinds of pleasures and pretend that it's not. But then you find that it's 
that sneaky part of the mind is going to overthrow all the good things you've done. So you've got to be careful. You've got to feed the mind well. There are other ways to think strategically, too. This evening I was reading a letter from someone who had noticed in the sutta where the Buddha is teaching the Rahula breath meditation. Before he teaches him breath meditation, he teaches him some contemplations, and one of them is to learn how to see all the elements of the body as, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. And the guy writing the letter said, well, wait a minute, in breath meditation you're focusing on the breath element, which is one of those elements. So what's going on here? If it's not yourself, then why focus on it? You're focusing on it because simply being told that it's not yourself is not enough to make you get rid of your attachments. You've got to explore it. To what extent can you really control the breath? Push it and see how far you can go. And you find that you can go fairly far. You can create a sense of ease, a sense of well-being. And that becomes your nourishment on the path. But after a while, even with whatever mastery you've had of the breath, you find you run up against certain things that you can't control. And then you find that even when things are going well in the mind, the concentration is good. The concentration is unstable. It's based on fabrication. And so it's got to change. It's got to be in constant. And that's where you see it. Before you'd heard it, and now you're trying to push against inconstancy, against the principle of inconstancy, stress, and not self. You're making the mind as constant and full of ease and as much under control as you can. And in doing that, you push it up against the wall. You finally find where that wall is. So there's another way in which you have to think strategically. Because the unskillful states of the mind are very clever. Sometimes a frontal attack doesn't work, so you have to attack them from the side. And sometimes you have to pretend like you're not doing battle, but you're watching. You're very careful. You keep pushing, pushing, pushing as you can. From this direction, from that direction. This is why ingenuity is required. This is how you turn your knowledge of those lists of the Dharma into actual warrior knowledge. It's not just a matter of doing as you're told. Sometimes you have to turn things around a little bit to see what's going to work precisely for you. This is why the Buddha didn't say that there's one particular meditation technique for each particular defilement. In other words, like contemplation of the body, like the chant we had just now, it's not just for lust, it's for other things too. It's, it can also be for pride. It also can be for the mind's tendency to say, well, I don't want to push things too much tonight because if I sit for long periods of time it's going to make my legs ache and maybe it'll do damage to my nerves or damage to the blood vessels or maybe I'm cut off the blood to my, my legs, whatever. But then you can think about it, go, what do you got in those legs? Well, it's just flesh and bone and skin. And at some point you're going to have to let go of it anyhow, so you might as well get good use out of it while you've got it. When you think of it that way, this contemplation of the body can actually give you more strength to sit for longer periods of time. So be alive to the fact that different contemplations can be used for lots of different things. And use your ingenuity. Remembering these principles, choose your battles. Think strategically. Be on your guard all the time. And finally, be prepared for setbacks. This is normal. Every warrior is going to have to lose some battles. You think about George Washington during the Revolutionary War, there are times when it looked pretty hopeless. But 
but he didn't let himself get discouraged. There's going to be a back and a forth, and hope, hopefully you learn from the back and forth. And John Mahabhu's image is of someone who goes into the ring and does battle as a boxer and will lose. But when you lose, you're trying to figure out, well, why did I lose? And sometimes the winner will show a weak side that you didn't notice before, but you notice it, then you can remember that for the next time. If you don't engage the opponent, you'll never know where the opponent's strengths and weaknesses are. And so be prepared to lose, but learn from the loss. Learn from the defeat and make it sh sure that it's not a total defeat, that you're able to come back. Which also means don't get discouraged. We like to hear these stories of the great Ajans, and the one step up the, the path after another, after another, after another. And it sounds like it was nothing, there were no setbacks. Every Ajahn has had setbacks. In fact, those are the ones that you can take heart from. Because they took heart. They realized that they didn't have to get discouraged and they didn't losing out, having a miserable night of concentration or having your defilements flare up after you thought you'd had them taken care of. It's not a sign of total defeat. It's just a sign you learned one lesson, but there are other lessons to learn. So keep these four principles in mind. Oftentimes our problems is when we want, decide we want to be warriors, we don't know anything about being a warrior. We just take on any, any battle that comes our way. And do it in a very naive way. You've got to choose your battles, be on your guard, use your ingenuity to be strategic, and keep your spirits up all the time. This is how you're going to come out winning. <laughs>